My name is Morris Gutman, and I've been developing some tools for uh, Paul Thompson's lab at IGC for uh, not necessarily doing a new kind of working group, even though this is in the new working group section, but more of a way to give you a new phenotype to work with, uh, given all the interesting associations you might, be, you might hear about. So, um, well, that's the outline. So, uh, first of all, why do uh, subcortical shape? What is subcortical shape for us? Well, uh, so subcortical shape is something that uh, is completely complementary to uh, the things we've all done, or most of us have done already, which is um, subcortical volume. Uh, there are plenty of papers uh, in various diseases, John Chernansky from 2004 in schizophrenia, you know, Paul's work and my work from, uh, from some time ago, uh, some recent work in Parkinson's that show uh, sometimes you are underpowered to get a volumetric uh, significant result, but shape actually gives a significant result in the same exact sample. Uh, so that's, uh, that's basically uh, uh, the biggest motivation. Now, when we talk about doing uh, voxel-wise uh, kind of studies, uh, you know, voxel-wise GWAS or voxel-wise uh, TBM uh, case control studies, uh, we have a huge multiple comparison scrum, and uh, you know, there's like two million voxels that we're talking about. And shape is kind of like a training wheel step uh, towards that, where you still have a, a multivariate uh, kind of a spatially localizing set of features, but it's not quite two million; it's more like fifteen thousand or something. And uh, the main, like, the other main thing that, that may be appealing about it is uh, many of you guys and your sort of resident uh, site PIs have run FreeSurfer on tens of thousands of images. Actually running the shape bit on top of FreeSurfer is quite fast, quite easy. Uh, doesn't take much. Um, I think I just went back. Okay. So the methods, uh, this slide is just for, uh, for completeness, but obviously have to uh, segment the uh, the cortex, so segment the, excuse me, the, the MRI image. Uh, we use the, the standard uh, subcortical regions that have been used in Enigma uh, to surf. Uh, the next step, the actual shape processing, you define <coughs> geometric models, define fine correspondences, so you can do these kind of uh, spatially aware uh, analyses. Uh, and then uh, the last step is what are you actually measuring at every point? Uh, well, you're measuring things that we try to keep as intuitive as possible. Uh, basically, each point has two measures, each of which represents sort of how much bigger or smaller things are in various aspects. Uh, you know, how, how thick the shape is or how dilated the specific region is relative to an average template. Uh, so, um, the last step is sort of uh, just like Derek's uh, voxel-wise meta-analysis, and it's just uh, meta-analysis uh, in a massive and variant way. And uh, then you, can, you correct for uh, you do have zero correction for multiple comparisons. Uh, so in this example, you see uh, something was in the schizophrenia group. Uh, here you only have two uh, two cohorts, although we now have processed. I think with Theo's latest edition, we've run the shape processing on a lot more. Uh, and you can kind of see that you know instead of just volume, you get a picture that might even suggest something interesting about a subfield. Uh, for example, that, that hippocampal. A significant region looks like the CA1 uh, subfield. Although we'll see if that holds once you add more cohorts. Uh, so this is shape and enigma so far. Uh, this slide probably is not complete, and also it may be a bit optimistic in some respects, a bit misleading. But basically, uh, there have been a number of groups, uh, some of whose data is already been processed uh, with the pipeline that we're uh, handing out. Um, uh, only one that I know of is actually uh, just about to submit something, uh, an actual manuscript to a journal, but just about all of them have at least an abstract. Uh, I think the schizophrenia group is probably the farthest along uh, with, like I said, about eight, uh, eight cohorts processed at four different sites. We have a number of people competent, competently able to use the tools. Uh, so some of these single uh, cohort uh, studies that uh, uh, Christopher Ching at the IGC has run uh, are examples of the smaller kind of startup uh, in the other groups. Uh, Sean Hatton from uh, Sydney is helping us with Leanne to do uh, shape and MDD, and uh, uh, ADHD, Parkinson's, uh, and even epilepsy have all been uh, have all, all have results at this point, and I think many of them probably have posters uh, at uh, at OHPM. So the two in yellow, the OCD group and the addiction group, I basically have gotten I think an email from. 
he was not uh, expressing interest uh, for uh, for addiction and the same for OCD from uh, from Dan Stein. But so there's some interest in others, and there's actually other groups that aren't groups but uh, could potentially be groups that I'm not putting on here. Uh, so some examples. Okay, we just saw this thing. High level of redundancy in these slides. So it's, uh, again, the schizophrenia study. Uh, we found some things uh, just in two cohorts. Could not find them in any one of them uh, by themselves. Uh, some, some of them, anyway. Um, so here's some more examples of uh, Chris Ching's work uh, comparing some types of bipolar, which incidentally uh, could not be found. Uh, some of these results were not significant. We're just comparing volumes. Uh, same with uh, HIV. Uh, but in this case, it's not uh, case control. Um, so basically things, and this is, by the way, uh, a nice kind of throwback to what we're talking about, about uh, laterality, uh, which is, uh, uh, this was a uh, study by Pamela Douglas uh, using shape asymmetry uh, in the caudate, just in the caudate. Uh, and in fact, the measure that she used here in this particular map is exactly what uh, folks are calling the symmetry index. It's basically left minus right divided by the mean. Uh, what we found, interestingly enough, is that you couldn't... Uh, volume was barely significant for this measure, uh, but neither volume nor uh, shape were significant uh, when you just use lateralized measures. It's just right versus right or left versus left in uh, typically developing subjects versus uh, ADHD. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. Uh, and uh, also should be something that we may be able to use in and the laterality group, in addition to the, the volume and the vertical uh, analysis. Uh, so anyway, uh, something I thought I'd bring up, even though we never really talked about it, I think, up till now, but uh, it's entirely possible to do vertex-wise GWAS, just like we've tried doing uh, box-wise GWAS. And I think, it, again, it would be a great kind of training step, uh, because you're, you're already doing a, kind of a multivariate, you know, hi highly multivariate uh, phenotype, but it's still restricted enough for the multiple comparisons. Basically, the number of tests you're doing is, uh, I think, two orders of magnitude less, basically, than what you'll be doing in a full TBM map in a box-wise image. So this could be this could be a good way to go. Obviously, we haven't. I've tried. We haven't found any hits uh, in uh, the few cohorts that we've tried. Derek obviously found. He just regressed something against uh, the putamen uh, in the image and data set for the uh, for the patient paper. We had some nice significant results there. Um, incidentally, the map on the left is uh, a heritability map. Uh, it's, it's something that Nada Jahan showed, and I wrote for a little conference a few months ago. And uh, shape is heritable. Uh, and this is a meta, meta heritability analysis of uh, HCP and QTEM. Uh, so, some practical things in case you're thinking about whether or not to uh, to join this. Uh, so the, currently, we have a Perl script that just takes in your FreeSurfer uh, output as the input. Uh, everything's downloadable as a Perl script in a standalone binary. You don't need any packages. It's just, it just runs. Uh, the only part, as usual, that is a bit time consuming is the QC. Now, I have to give a big thanks to Kate Alpert uh, and Lei Wang's group, uh, neither of whom can be here. But uh, they did uh, as good a job as I think you could to make it painless and streamlined to do visual QC once you've uh, done all the uh, all the autom automated steps. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Uh, so again, the shape processing, uh, real simple. Uh, the actual running of, the, of those first two shape processing steps takes about an hour for the entire, uh, for the, you know, all of your ROIs. You might be interested in less if you, if you want a subset. Uh, and it's just one command. It just works on any Linux distribution. It doesn't even have to be a specific one. Uh, just like a recon all kind of a thing. <coughs> to surfer. Uh, the QC, uh, basically this, there's a script that takes your uh, shape outputs and your original free surfer T1 inputs. Uh, makes a, a nice palette of uh, images that so you can just kind of go through them real quick on your, machine, on your computer. Uh, and visually check them. I mean, it works, I think, as fast as you, as you could probably do this kind of work. What we find is often uh, you pick up things that you should be able to find as not passing QC if you were doing the free surfer uh, QC properly, but folks often just don't. So uh, this actually helps see, see what's failing and what's not failing, even the, the free surfer stuff a bit better. Um, we also have some examples. 
uh, for what we consider good, what we consider okay, mm -hmm. and make it as easy as possible. And if you really can't tell, if you're interested in doing this step yourself, uh, we have people that'll tell you what we think. But you can just email them and say, is this kosher or not? Uh, so uh, the last bit of this practicalities uh, section is uh, how does this actually fit? What is the kind of the algorithm in Enigma? So obviously the big thing about Enigma is uh, it's a balance between our willingness to share the data and our willingness to do the work uh, to, get, to get to the results in the publication. Uh, and I think maybe as, as more trust gets built, more of us are willing to share data uh, but perhaps it's not completely true for everyone for various reasons. So there's basically three, you know, three ways we can do this. And there's been, uh, we've done all three already with the groups that have uh, participated. Uh, so the basic one is you just send us the free server output and the T1 image. Uh, and obviously the, all the interesting uh, conical variables, etc. that you're interested in. So that's, you know, that's straight up sharing and we do everything uh, for you. Uh, not my favorite way. Um, so the second way is kind of an amalgamation where we say, okay, because the measures that we're actually using, the phenotype we're using is so sort of, there's so many derivation steps between the original image and the final phenotype. It's not, perhaps the privacy issue is not as uh, severe here, so maybe we're willing to share the final output of the shape pipeline. Uh, in this case, no raw data gets shared. Uh, you just share the PNGs and the uh, and the raw files that contain the uh, the shape measures, and we do everything for you after that. So that still leads to a kind of a, a mega analysis essentially, and it still requires you to share per subject uh, clinical data. And the final step, which I think is, I guess, my favorite because it requires at least work for us and most work for everyone else, is a true, a true meta analysis where you you do everything on site, you do the QC on site again. We, we, we're willing to support you in the QC. Uh, if, if there's trouble, and simply send us the, the per vertex per point uh, summary stats. Uh, I should also say that I, it says IGC a lot of places in this, in this slide, but it doesn't have to be IGC. Uh, it can be, uh, at some point I imagine there'll be competent enough uh, sites that can do all of this in, in our place. And uh, I guess the kind of a vision that I have is if we do go, if most people do go with the pipeline on the right, at some point, once you've learned how to use these tools, you can just use them without our involvement at all for your local, whatever, uh, studies of interest, and that's totally fine. Uh, so I think that's probably all for me.